It's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquand and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. came through here last month, headed for Temeria. Friend. Another witch. Hmm? Bless that prick with my fullest efforts too. And he What's a Temeria? All... Do you not just hear me talking? Shouldn't you know when someone's pretending? It's been three nights. Pay up or get out. Temeria. It's got a pest problem. A few miners rounded up 3,000 orans to have it killed. Your boy took the coin and ran. You hear me? Thank you. For... everything. Hey, panelers. Welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this week, we're only going to do one episode for The Witcher Season 1. We're just going to do Episode 3. Basically, a lot's been going on, a lot of wearing down, everybody is in their own element. So, we're going to take this time, because honestly, I needed the time to actually watch the show a couple more times, the episodes. So, that works out better. Yeah. So, that like gives me a little bit more. Yeah, it's this is completely, I want everybody to know, it, it, Mark, Mark wanted to pre- keep doing two episodes. I was just like, man, I really, one episode a week works better for me. And he was like, okay, that sounds good. So I uh, I think we're just to do one episode a week, kind of slow it down a little bit. And uh, these might be a little bit shorter, but then we can still cover it over a little bit more time. Maybe we'll get closer to 100 and see where we're at and do something big with our 100th episode when it comes up. Oh, definitely. I definitely want to do something big. So I, I guess we should start reaching out to celebrities <laughs> or somebody. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the synopsis for Witcher Season 1, Episode 3, Betrayer Moon. Geralt takes on another Witcher's unfinished business in a kingdom stalked by a ferocious beast. At a brutal cost, Yennefer forges a magical new future. Which is pretty cool because this is, like, we do see some sort of rebirth of Yennefer in this. And we see something out of Geralt that we never saw before. And there was a couple of things that I saw, but I don't think you caught them. <laughs> but I, I... Yeah, no, that's that's the reason why we do this is, is uh, so we can each pick up on different things and and see i really enjoyed this this episode i thought it was really cool to see kind of another side of Geralt and also yennefer we got a very quick glimpse at siri she doesn't have a big part in this episode but there's a lot of things in this episode episode three and especially the next episode episode four that really set up the entire season really and there's something that occurred to me as i was just thinking through this a little bit that maybe even for future seasons so yeah definitely uh there's a lot laid in within a first season that could expand on into other seasons absolutely and then that way we have more of this branding honestly the the witcher series and the book form went pretty long from my understanding as well as the uh the gaming so you know that that's a cool thing so that now you know they could expand on it with the cinematic aspect of this and we could get more story out of this it doesn't necessarily have to be coming from the actual source material. We could actually get more from the creators and, you know, like certain characters in there. I, I still love the minstrel and everything. Yeah. So, you know, to me, that those are things that are cool in my aspect. It, it just keeps me captivated. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So we should actually get into our top fives. Don't judge me. Absolutely. You want me to start? Sure. 
All right. So it, that opening monologue with the, the guy who's dying and he's talking about the creation of the, the Vu, I had to look up how to spell it. Vukodlik. I don't know how they, they, they say it weirdly in the show, but the Vukodlik, V-U-K-O-D-L-A-K. He uh, he's describing how this this monster is created. He says that a wolf has to walk over the grave of a pregnant woman who died before she gave birth. Uh, and then beast grows inside her belly, feeding off of her until it can't until it doesn't get any more nutrients. And then it bursts out of the grave to wreak havoc. I had I never heard of this this kind of monster before. I even tried when I tried looking up the name Vukalik, all I could get was stuff about vampires. So I'm not <laughs> sure and even it looked like even in the game, which is where this kind of comes from, it's more of a vampiric sort of creature or monster. But so I thought that was really interesting. We get this whole monologue about how this thing is created. And then when we get to my next point, it kind of is all a wash. So to me, I actually, my number five is just the same, but yeah, I couldn't understand the book. Like, <laughs> it sounded yeah. made up to me, honestly. I, I I looked for it just like you on wikis and everything else. I couldn't find anything, really. Honestly, it, it sounds to me like something that The Witcher once stated. Sometimes they are not true, like these things right. that they talk about. So it, it could be something that was related to maybe the book or the game itself. So in the book, it might not have been there, and then in the game, it was. And then in, the, in this case, they just kind of made it a mix. Right, right. Or like a weird joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's weird, yeah. Because that, that goes right to my number four, which is that we find out what the actual monster is. The actual monster is a Striga, and even though it, that's another one of those things that Geralt has this back and forth with the sorceress about. She's like, those aren't real. And he goes, well, no, there's the, actually the Striga is real. It's created from a curse. And, you know, the thing that, that made me, I had to laugh every time I watched this. The way he figured this out is he's rooting around in the guy's body, you know, like with his gloved <laughs> hand. And yeah, yeah. He's not even looking. He can just tell by feel through his glove that the guy's heart and liver are missing. And he's like, well, there's only one beast that eats that is that picky of an eater. And that's a Striga. And I'm like, what? Like, dude, you just like you dug into it. And even the sorceress is like, obviously, you two uh, knew each other well or something like that. You know? or, yeah. Or he knows a body well enough to put his hand inside. Yeah. Go, yeah, I know that's that. No, it's not there. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. Like, if, like, if he was at least looking into it, I could say, OK, at least he's looking. But no, there's all this uh, sand or salt or whatever was over the body. He's just just running his hand around in there inside the carcass. <laughs> Just the heart and liver are missing. <laughs> I was just, all right, girl, that's a new, that's a new skill that I hadn't uh, thought you had. That's a kind of a surprising and creepy ability, but okay, go for it. <laughs> he knows how to feel around inside a corpse and know exactly what's missing. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> My number four would be the Striga is a princess. Wow. Yeah. Something, yeah, that, that's something that's new to me, which is interesting, and, and I like the idea, because at the very end of the episode, we do see her, and she is a young, you know, a young girl, too, and then he has to do her in in some way, which to me was like, wow. No, no, she lived. He didn't kill her. She... She's she lived. She 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 scratches him. Yeah. But then later he says he asked the sorceress, well, what about the princess? And she's like, she's OK. Oh, OK. Uh, y you know, so he he did ask about that, about the bite, you know, because she's like she could see where because he hurt her, you know, and he asks about her neck and she's like, it'll heal or something like that. So, no, that and that was what kind of what I was talking about at the beginning is that I don't think we ever see that character Again, that princess. No, we don't, and I we, think that might come in next season. For all we know, that's that's what I'm hoping is that we'll we'll find out something about her next season. You know that I, I thought it was really really cool that because I, I at first I know the first time I watched this way back, and then when, even when I binged it, I kind of thought maybe that's Siri, but then I was like, no, that doesn't fit the narrative. Yeah, that that would be the the princess Siri. So it doesn't that doesn't make any sense. And plus, I don't think we revisited this kingdom at all so so yeah I, i'm hoping that next season we're going to see more of this sorceress and maybe this this king foltus and but you know we'll see yeah definitely you're number three Oh, my number three. Is, we kind of talked a little bit about it, but it, this whole plan this guy had, and I don't remember what his name was, the the Lord whatever who was the king's kind of advisor there, it's, it's a really pretty messed up plan because basically he said he was in love with 
this Princess Ada. And, you know, Geralt, like, he could smell him on her sheets, and he knew that even after she had, she had become the Striga, or even if she died and her baby became the Striga, he still was going back to that room. And for a minute... It almost seemed like for a minute that Geralt thought this guy might be the father, but he he is sure that Foltis was the father of the child because that's what the guy says. The guy says, well, you know, what they were doing was wrong, and so I didn't curse her. I cursed him, and it's just a whole messed up plan. That, so basically what you're saying is you love this girl so much that you cursed her brother who's having sex with her and then she dies <laughs> she gets killed so you're basically trying to hurt and then you want to basically tear the kingdom down because this striga that's created from her pregnant corpse is now running amok and the peasants are ready to overthrow the king i'm like this is just the most confusing plan that like had to be born out of some crazy man's you know, psyche because it just doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's like, why didn't you just expose the affair? And he's because I didn't want to hurt Ada, but you did hurt Ada because she died. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, don't get it, man. The, the plan just seemed weird to me, and and uh, you know, he got what he deserved when he got tore up by the streak. So, what's your number three? Well, that would be the Witcher states that Princess Ada that the curse was there and. and- Pretty much like an overgrown abortion in some ways, if you look at it, just the way she was. It, it, it's really scary to think, but that's all yeah. I got. Okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, okay. Now, so I want to talk a little bit, going into my number two, talk a little bit about we get the timeline here. We kind of get a timeline set up here because Yennefer... During that dance, that scene where where they're all dancing, and after she's she's become beautiful, there's there's a queen there, and she's kind of scolding a boy and a girl, the boy and the girl that we saw in the painting in the ruined castle, and she calls the boy Foltest and says, you know, don't bother your sister. So this helps us see that Yennefer's timeline is way before the events that are occurring now, because of course now we're seeing the grown up, or you know, probably in his fifties, looks like. Foltis, who's as a king. So we, we get to see kind of that timeline. And they also talk about Calinthe being a princess mm. uh, and not yet being a, a king. So so that fits the timeline. And then we also, this is going to play in later into the season, but we also see how Frangilla ends up becoming the mage of Nilfgaard and why she has such an animosity toward Yennefer. Because Jennifer basically took her the spot she was supposed to have, mm. you know, and and we're going to see that play out in the last two episodes when we see Frangilla just being so set on destroying all these kingdoms and waging war on the other the other sorceresses. Sorceressi? Sorceressi? <laughs> Whatever. Sorceresses. <laughs> sorceresses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So where does that bring us? My number three, which, yeah, I found it odd that we find out that Yennefer was born of elven blood. And when the chapter voted, I I guess that's where she got her powers regardless of having a deformity. This was something new to me. Uh, To me, I, I think that's where it really all stemmed from. And that's why they were able to track her because she has this in her you know, this blood in her body, um, it's just part of her genes. Yeah, they they don't really explain a lot of that. Like, she reveals to, it was in episode two, I think, uh, where she, or is it the beginning? It might be the beginning of this episode where she reveals to Istrid that she's of elven. I think it might have been the second episode when she revealed that to him, yeah. that she was of elven blood. And then he went back and reported it uh, basically to the council. And he even says that in here. He says, it was just a, a manipulation. It was what I was supposed to do. I was brought here to find out about you. And they explain how because she has elven blood, she can never be the mage of her home because they hate elves. And so now that that explains some of the way her father felt toward her and maybe even her mother, you know, that that was willing to sell her so easily. And just this, this whole idea of, of her having this elven blood in her. And I, I don't know if it's ever explored again later in the series. I don't think in the season. I don't think so. No, I don't think so I, I think either. It, I don't think it ever comes up again. You know, she had that piece of paper that she was going to try to take to the council that was her father signing. 
that he was that she was pure blood, not uh, of Elvin, and she tries to convince Istrid to change his mind and and denounce his story, and he's like, he can't, and that's where it gets a little bit confusing with this whole way, because basically what she does is she forces the guy, right, the one that transforms them into whatever their ideal self is. And she kind of forces him to do the procedure on her. And then she just walks into the banquet and this king asks her who she is. And when she reveals that she's from the town of his kingdom, he's like, well, then you should be my mage, not this other one, mm. you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's how Frangella loses her, her spot. So it's, it's, it's all interesting. And it also puts that these sorceresses, uh, don't don't age, uh, you know. Don't age either. No, they don't. Know? They don't, or, or they age very slowly because just like Geralt, because Geralt looks exactly the same in every timeline we see him in. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, Geralt doesn't show any aging. Uh, I think uh, Queen what was it Caranthi. Calanthe, Calanthe, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah she we, ages. We do see that, right? We get to see her, and we'll talk some more about Kalenthi in a little bit. Exactly. Uh, uh, I have no idea where we're at, because I think your numbers got mixed up. Number two? Yeah, but you had two number threes. I have two number threes? You, yeah, <laughs> look at the document. You had two number threes. <laughs> and then you're, and then you, so you're, we're at your number two, and then we both had the same number one. Oh, okay. Well, I'll... Yeah. <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll put my first number through. No, just do your number two. That's where we're at. We're at your number two now. You did both your number threes, so we're good. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yennefer's rebirth, as it were, she transfers into the Yennefer that we see throughout the rest of the season. I find that pretty cool because now she's that she got she has no hump. She doesn't have the uh, distorted face. Uh, this is it, pretty much the Yennefer that we see throughout the rest of the season. And I think uh, coming seasons. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure she's not going to ever change back to that. Because it seemed like this was... Like, at first, I kind of thought maybe this was just like a glamour. Like, just people saw her this way. But but after watching this scene, watching it the, the, the last time I watched, uh, there's a physically she changed actually physically and that's why she told him to you know leave her eyes the same which i thought was interesting and she said leave the scars on her wrist from where she had tried to slit her wrists she said because mm. she wants those reminders of who she of who she was and so i thought that was really cool uh that she wanted to have that that again that memory and and not lose those those parts of herself in this transformation, but then of course she also loses her ability to bear children, and I don't know if yeah. that's I don't know if that's a side effect that they all go through if they go through this. It, it was a little weird because we didn't see anybody else go through this transformation, but yet the uh, head whatever the teacher explains to her that you know when we look in the mirror we see our ideal self and that's what he's going to do for you. And so it, it almost, I wonder if this is almost a procedure that not everybody gets, but only if you are, you know, considered ugly or you're, you have some sort of deformity. That's the only time you go through this, this particular procedure with this guy. Well, I, I think that comes from, what was it? The episode two, where she goes through her magic training. Mm -hmm. And if you wish something or want something within magic, it takes away something else. Right. Right, and that I think that's where that stems from, but that's just my thoughts, yeah. because that one oh, that girl was, sense. you yeah. know, thinking of something, and then her hand just turns to stone or something, yeah. and that was taken away from her because she enchanted her or did right. some. Sort and see, of I think that was Frangella. I think that was Frangella. And I think if you, if you, I was trying to really watch for her hand because I think from the rest of the series, when we see Frangella, she has a glove on that hand. I mm -hmm. think because I think that was Frangilla who that happened to, and I yeah. don't think her hand ever healed. So I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if that's that glove that we see. I think I could be wrong on that. Somebody correct me if I'm incorrect on that. Uh, yeah. But and we'll see more of Frangilla as the series progresses, and I want to really pay attention to that hand to see. Yeah, it, it, it I, I, I really do think that's what was going on, and that's why Yennefer had that 
issue why mm-hmm. she had to give up something in order right. to gain something. Right, and, and in because this case, her, yeah, yeah, yeah she, yeah, she gained her beauty, uh, a beauty, beautiful body or outward right. look of what she wanted. She had to lose something inside, and that's probably why she wasn't able right. to bear children. Makes sense, and it had to be something something big because the transformation was was so huge. Was so exactly it was you know. it was it looked like it hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's well, that's what he told her because he he at first was like he's like well it's gonna take me some time to prepare the herbs to you know to like lessen the pain and she's like no I don't I I want to feel the pain and I thought again that's another one of those interesting character traits of Yennefer that she wants to go through the pain so yeah she wants to suffer to gain what she always wanted yep. yeah. Uh, so that brings us to our number ones, which yep. is I think we we have both the same number ones. Just this the fight with the Striga. I thought it yeah. was it was really really a good fight. We haven't seen him really since episode one. We haven't seen him do a big um, have a big kind of fight scene like this. And and so it was it was cool to see him like he took that potion before when the guy says well you gotta you gotta fight with her all you know all the way till dawn. And so he takes some sort of weird potion and then you know we see him use his powers again which is kind of cool he's kind of throwing her around and using that that force uh blast or or whatever force push you know that she's throw and then he does that thing where he he collapses the ground beneath him the the part of the castle i thought that was so cool uh and then of course he puts on those those magic knuckles and and starts fighting her with those so it was really a cool cool scene a lot of stuff happening in there oh definitely and i really enjoyed it and that's you know like you that's my number one yeah and and of course the brett like instead of brass knuckles it's silver knuckles and they're all wolves yeah and he's just beating him and uh, it just makes me think of that werewolf folklore it's like you have to use silver or a silver mm-hmm. bullet or something silver so yeah. that kind of fed into that idea, and I love that. And the fact that he, he does take that potion, but you see, like you said, and you stated that he goes really extreme on this. Yeah, and I thought that was pretty cool. But and in a sense that he was able to get the task done that the other Witcher wasn't able to do. Yeah, yeah, you know, like he he throws those chains around her, and when she breaks out of the chains, he's like. Ugh. Like he's like, okay, there goes Plan A. I guess I gotta go to Plan B, you know. And I guess I gotta go to Plan C. And I guess I gotta go to Plan D. And uh, so it was really, it was really pretty cool. It was a, it was a good, good fight. I, it, I think I backed it up a number of times and watched. Some I, I things. think I watched it a good three times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just to, just to get the full effect. <laughs> But. Uh, so before we get to notes, we've got a, a, a few quotes here that I thought was uh, – that uh, both of us have that I thought was really, really cool. I love at the beginning when he's with the prostitute and she's like telling him this story about the other witcher and he interrupts her and she's like, did you not just hear me talking? And he goes, shouldn't you know when someone's pretending? I thought that was great. <laughs> shouldn't you know when someone's pretending? You know, like I'm not paying attention to you really. You're just no, – no, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, I love when the Witcher goes, don't judge me, to the horse. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, that was great. When he's leaving him, he's leaving him behind at the at the end because he's got to pay for his room. And Yeah. Uh, then the, the last one I have, or the second one, I the last one I have is uh, that when he's talking to that sorceress and he's he's talking about how she, how, ju- how she says, oh, it's just money and magic and monsters to you or money and monsters to you. And he's trying to say that's all it is. But she's like, no, there's more going on with you. And she says, there is a vortex of fate around each and every one of us. I thought that was really a cool kind of poetical yeah. way of telling him, hey, you've got a destiny that you're going to have to fulfill. Oh, definitely. My last one would be uh, a, a life of holding dust pants as you push off broken bones. That's not destiny. That's slow suicide. And that was from Yennefer to Istrid. Yeah, yeah, what he's talking about, because she knows he wants to go, whatever, uncover bones or be like an archaeologist kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we both have a, a – you've got one note, and I've got a, a few notes here mm-hmm. that we didn't – I don't think we covered. Yeah. I don't think any of mine were, were covered. So do you want to go with yours, and then I'll just run through mine real quick? Sure. Mine was I, – I think this is the first time we saw The Witcher actually having some sort of carnal needs as being a person. <laughs> he he was with a woman in bed, the the prostitute. That was something that was more real within the show, I think, because it shows – some sort of human aspect 
and mind you, we always look at him as being something supernatural because that's what everybody always talks about. I really like that element. Yeah, that was it was really cool to see that he he even he has these kind of needs, whether it's whether it's just simply the like you said, the carnal need to, to release that kind of sense. Yeah, I mean, I think what didn't she say he, he'd been there for three days or, or the when the guy when the innkeeper knocks on the door, he's like, it's been three days pay up or get out. And so yeah. he pays the prostitute and then she's like, well, what about for the room? And he's like, so that's why he's got to leave his horse there. And uh, uh, as so payment yeah. pretty much. So, yeah. <laughs> so I just had a few, I'll run through these really, really quick. Uh, I thought it was a little, it was a little silly that when he got the guards to leave, all he did was throw some rocks at him. And I, I don't know what was that supposed to simulate? Like they thought maybe the wall was going to fall down on them. And so they just run away. I was a little, that seemed a little bit too easy for me when the when the guards are guarding the castle. We talked a little bit already about his senses, just the different things he goes in smelling and he's knowing well, what's happening. Yeah. And then <laughs> the whole brother-sister thing, I, I don't get it. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. Uh, Same here. Uh, I, I love that at the end we have that, that quick scene of the woods kind of calling out to Siri, and we're going to get that in the next episode. We're going to see what happens with her, and I think we see we even see what happens with the elf boy who's getting all the arrows shot at him. And another, just the final thing, final little note about this episode that I had was we don't see Jaskier, the bard, in this. We do know that some time has passed because the prostitute is singing these different songs about his exploits and she's like tracing his scars and he's like this was the vampire and she sings a little line of the vampire thing and then there's another one and she sings a little line about what happened with that and then she sees the scar from the first episode where i think that's where Renfrey cut him yeah and uh, so i thought that was really kind of a cool little nod to the audience that even though we don't see jaskier this episode he's still present and he's still doing what he said that he was going to spread the witcher's fame around the country yeah definitely so we had some feedback right yeah let me play our feedback from lara uh, our friend lara sent in some audio so i'm going to play it right now hey mark and steve how's it going this is lara i wanted to send some feedback on the witcher I thought this was a pretty fun, exciting series that dropped. I had no history with the books or the games or anything. I just, I'm a fan of fantasy and I thought I would check it out. So not knowing anything about any of the characters or any of the stories, I just started watching it. I agree it was a little confusing at first, but I think probably by the third episode and definitely by the fourth, I totally caught on to the multiple timelines and it's the fun thing about it is once you catch on to that, you can go back and rewatch the series and there are definitely hints they keep on dropping. I think uh, the bits about Queen Calanthe are kind of the touchstones that show you the hints as you're watching along because uh, every time a character mentions something about Queen Calanthe, you kind of get an indication as to where you are in the timeline. I really enjoyed the character of Geralt and especially enjoyed the character of Yaskir. He is my favorite. I love his humor. I love that the show gives itself a little bit of a self-referential meta humor in the way it, that Yaskir talks about his exposition and he's, he's always giving a little wink and a nudge to the audience that they realize that <laughs> This is, yeah. you know, a little ridiculous or whatever. And I love that because I think it's cool that they don't take themselves too seriously. I mean, the story's great. The action is awesome. But it's not a fantasy like Game of Thrones that takes itself too seriously. And I think that's what makes it so much fun. One of my favorite characters. And at first, I, I wasn't sure if I liked her. I mean, I definitely pitied her. And, and then later, you're kind of like, hey, what's up with this girl? Why is she so... Why is she so pushy? Why is she so ambitious? But I love Yennefer, especially once you get to the end of the series. You just you just kind of fall in love with her. But one thing that I thought was really interesting about Yennefer as I watched the show is that I don't really think she goes through the transformation that she goes through in episode three to become beautiful. I really don't think... She has a problem with her looks. I, you know, I don't think she's vain about it, 
but I think the thing that angers her and the reason she punched the mirror and everything is because she is upset with injustice. She she hates the injustice of the world and that because she was born a hunchback and because she is looked down upon, she has no power in this world. And to Yennefer, I think that is the most important thing that we will realize as the series go goes on is that she wants power. She was born this powerless, impoverished person whose, frankly, mother didn't even care enough about her to keep her from being taken away to, um, oh shoot, I forgot the name of the, the school. I'm kind of Eritiza. just <laughs> letting yeah. ideas roll off my head. But yeah, Tasea takes her off to uh, Witcher Hogwarts and, and her mother doesn't even <laughs> try to fight yeah, for her. So, funny. you know, she feels like there's just this huge injustice in the world and she feels like to her beauty is not about vanity beauty is about power and she takes that power for herself and and starts to use it and then she realizes that it's not all that it's cracked up to be and i kind of feel that because i think in uh episode three we see that or maybe it's four oh, but we see that you know she's having some fun uh sexy times with is isrid Isrid, <laughs> and uh, she's still a hunchback, so she has no shame about how she looks or anything. I mean, heck, she even creates an audience for them that gives them a standing ovation. <laughs> but uh, I think, yeah, for her, beauty just equals power and what you can do with that power. I love the character of Geralt. If you uh, do a little research, you'll find out that Henry Cavill actually really, really wanted to play the part of Geralt of Rivia. He was a big nerd of the video games, I believe. And when he found, or actually after he played the video games, he read all the books. And then when he found out it was going to become a series, he went after it with gusto trying to get the part and uh the showrunner is actually the uh one of the writers and producers on not only daredevil but especially the, def the defenders so i think that's probably one of the reasons i enjoy it so much these last two episodes are one of my favorites especially of banquets bastards and burials because that's when you get that aha moment that uh Calanthe's daughter has the same power as Siri, and things start to fall into place. So I am excited to hear you guys talk about these next two episodes, and I'll be listening in. One short addendum. Uh, you guys were talking about the portals last week and why why Yennefer can be tracked through her portals, and Isrid said that she couldn't be tracked using his. Well, on Yennefer, in Yennefer's, when she's with the queen who has the baby and she's trying to protect them, she actually says it's something that the queen is wearing that is being tracked. So listen for that. Yeah, she, she's breaking the jewelry. They're, they're trying to find out there's something on the queen that the assassin is tracking. So perhaps Yennefer can't be tracked, but the queen can. And you're right, Steve. I don't know why Isrid made that portal for Yennefer way back in the beginning. <laughs> and put her through it and said that she couldn't be tracked. And then, of course, to say I found her anyhow. So that's still a mystery to me. Okay, guys, bye. <laughs> well, thank you, Lara. Great voicemail. Thank you so much, Lara. That was amazing. That was... Um, I totally agree. I... I... Uh, my thoughts, yeah, I agree with you, Lara, that it, it took about four episodes to see the, the difference within the timeline. There were times out of place within the show but it was something out of like a like a, a quentin tarantino film in my opinion <laughs> plus you know that whole queen calanthe mm. is a big hint during that timeline you could see her aging or being young old it, it's kind of out of whack so that 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 was like a dead giveaway which is good and i uh, i do agree i love yes gear as well uh, I do agree with you on Yennefer being a great character. Uh, I like your outlook on the character. Please give any more information that you can. <laughs> that would be awesome. Absolutely. 
Yeah, until I heard this voicemail, I, it didn't even occur to me that Clint Thay really is kind of the touchstone throughout these episodes telling us. I love that that's what that's the word she used for the touchstone because really she is. We see Clint Thay at the very beginning of the series and then we're going to see her in episode eight. We're going to see that those same scenes from Geralt's perspective in, in the, that episode seven or eight. So I really like that. I, it didn't even occur to me until I heard her say that, that really Clint Thay is kind of that that touchstone that, that can tell us where we're at in the timeline every time. And I love that Yaskier is the, he's basically the audience perspective. I mean, he even said it in episode two, right? He said, oh, I'm just doing exposition. <laughs> That's all I'm here for. And uh, yeah. kind of a wink and a nod to the uh, the audience there. So I really love that. And I love what, what you said about Jennifer's vanity because I think you're, I totally think you're right. I don't think Yennefer became beautiful because she was, her self-esteem was bad or that she was, she didn't like the way she looked. I think she realized that the way she looked was not going to let her get to where she wanted to be. And so that's why she went through the transformation. It wasn't because of that she had a vanity and wanted to be beautiful. She realized that that was the only way she was going to accomplish the goals that she needed to accomplish that she wanted to accomplish. So yeah, great, great yeah. voicemail, Laura. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. You know, it's always good to have a third perspective or somebody sending in some feedback to actually change our thoughts because I, yeah. after hearing that, I, I thought right away, I was like, wow, yeah, that's a great insight. And I could see it that way. And I see it her way now. And now after, as I rewatch the next, what seven episodes i'm gonna have that in my head and i think that's mm -hmm. awesome exactly very cool so next episode is episode four we will be doing that next week of banquet sorry laura i know you you were looking forward to this too but we are going to switch to a, a one episode a week format at least for a few more weeks until things uh, die down for me and and for mark as well so that we can kind of kind of slow down a little bit so but next week's episode will be episode four of banquets bastards and burials and the synopsis i'll just go ahead and read it since we have it here is against his better judgment Geralt accompanies Yaskier to a royal ball Siri wanders into an enchanted forest Yennefer tries to protect her charges so looking forward to that and to hearing some more from Laura hopefully oh hopefully yeah and, and like listeners if you're out there just send in some feedback through our Facebook page we'll try to make it more on the Facebook so that way hey this is what we're covering this week that way you could leave some sort of feedback in a comment I know that uh, <laughs> a lot of you that just started listening were probably on the Grim Life Collective watch party last week that didn't go off with a great hitch unfortunately because cast kind of crashed and we weren't able to watch Haunted Honeymoon as much as we wanted. Some of you had audio issues, and I'm sorry about that. I am working on getting a new PC. So that way, if we do that, and I tend and I want to do that for Michael and Jessica, that way we could do that. I would also like to eventually merge that into what we're doing here and maybe do a watch party for people that listen to the podcast. And that way we can watch an episode and people could chime in with their thoughts. Because with what's going on in the world, we all need to come together and have fun and maybe just watch something together. So we might not do that with Witcher, but we could actually do that with something else. So after we're finished with Witcher, maybe we could actually create a watch party. And that way we could just all come together and have fun and then just make that available to everybody else. And we could podcast about it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. It's, it's, it's just an idea I came up with. So it, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, the only podcast recommendation I have for this week is just a reminder. And uh, it's coming up here in a week or so. I have been binge watching Penny Dreadful. And uh, listening to TV Podcast Industries coverage of those episodes and Penny Dreadful City of Angels will be starting up next week, April 26th. And uh, so looking forward to to chiming in on their their episodes of that. So check out TV Podcast Industries, Penny Dreadful podcast. Oh, definitely. And I also have to recommend the Westworld cast, which is with uh, House Podcastica. Uh, it's on House Podcastica, but it is a Westworld yes. cast. But that was that will be right. with Jason and David, and they are covering Westworld season three. And I enjoy listening to them. Yeah, they're doing a great they job. They have a great thing going on there, and I love David's insight. He is 
so intelligent. I just love hearing his voice too. He's got the perfect voice. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I just continue watching just like you guys. Sometimes I send in feedback as well. So uh my recommendation, go seek them out and listen to them. Very cool. Yeah. So this podcast can be heard on whatever podcast player of choice you use. If they have ratings available, please, please give us a five star rating. We we love to hear from you through reviews or feedback or emails or calls or whatever. You can go to our website, which is panels to pixels podcast.com. That'll redirect you to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can comment, write to us on there, send us a message, whatever. We will get back to you as quickly as we can you can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com that's panels to pixels one the to is spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com you can also call us and leave a voicemail at 845-350-2095 that's 845-350-2095 2095 and you can find us on youtube just search for panels to pixels podcast give us a thumbs up there subscribe to us and you can hear the episodes there as well awesome yeah definitely and where else can you could hear us basically i'm a co-host on the walking dead talk through with brian malosh and kyle mcadams on talk through media we review the walking dead each week this show, Panels to Pixels, will be on the Next Level Podcast Network Radio, and we will always leave a link in our Facebook page whenever we have a new episode for The Walking Dead Talk Through. Unfortunately, we don't have Walking Dead coming to us anymore at this point, right. so uh, we're coming up with some ideas of what we could do. If you want, there's a Patreon for The Walking Dead Talk Through. Go there, and we actually do Patreon calls. So we're looking to actually move forward with that a little bit more. As Steve and I are currently doing now, uh, we're recording this podcast. There is a Patreon call that we're both going to go on to. Exactly. So, yeah. So we're going to hop off this and jump on to that Patreon call. And it's a pretty much like a happy hour. So we're looking probably to do that with the Walking Dead talk through. Maybe do a live watch. We're not sure yet. But... If you have any suggestions, always send them our way, too. Absolutely. Uh, not only just here, but also at TalkThroughMedia.com, which you could also listen to on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Right now, we're looking to premiere our new show on Talk Through Media, which would be Let's Talk Through. So we just finished up our recording last week, and Kyle and I are in the midst of editing that particular episode which was the galaxy quest rewatch and review as well as the documentary that is called never surrender never give up never surrender so we all went through that so you could hear kyle ruthie lara and myself talk about the movie our favorite points behind it our favorite points behind the documentary everything that's influenced in pop culture because that's what let's talk through is based upon it's all about pop culture and what we do and what we love so you could hear our points on there look for that on talkthroughmedia.com and you can always hear me right here of course and i submit feedback to other podcasts especially uh, house podcastica you'll hear my voice on there just about every week and uh, strange indeed is taking a little bit of a break but uh, they just finished up lock and key which was a really good uh, show on Netflix so I submit feedback there and uh, just other places that my voice may pop up now and again well that's our show for tonight everybody thank you for listening always and be safe I'm Mark I'm, you're Mark I'm Mark I'm not Mark you're Mark I'm Steve <laughs> I'm Steve and you're Steve man I, I need a drink <laughs> Good night, everybody and this was Panels Pixels and we'll see you on the next panel Good night, everybody <laughs>